All right, everybody, uh, this is the second part of the cellular respiration of lecture in class. And what I want to help remind you about is that cellular respiration always starts with what process? It always starts with glycolysis. Okay, so glycolysis is the first part of cellular respiration. And we only get a net gain of 2 ATP out of glycolysis. Four are made all together, but it takes two to get the process kick-started. And the products of glycolysis are two pyruvic acids. P-Y... Oh, I misspelled it. Oh, P-Y-R-U-V-I. Two pyruvic acids. And the two pyruvic acids are what enter into the mitochondria to undergo Krebs cycle and the electron transport chain. I'm sorry, ETC, electron transport chain. This is gives us the complete breakdown of glucose, okay, glucose breakdown, to give the maximum amount of ATP. Um, and this is complete cellular respiration when it's aerobic. Um, we discussed in the last section what happens if there is no oxygen. Without oxygen, you can't do the Krebs cycle or the electron transport chain. And so pyruvic acid has to then be broken down in other ways. It can either go through alcoholic fermentation, if you're a yeast cell, or lactic acid fermentation in muscle cells in humans. And um, the products of alcoholic fermentation are alcohol and carbon dioxide. The products of lactic acid fermentation in our muscle cells are lactic acid and carbon dioxide. And after your body recovers from the strenuous activity, the lactic acid gets reconverted back into pyruvic acid. And if there's enough oxygen, then you go into Krebs cycle and the electron transport chain all over again. But what are we talking about if um, you, um, let's talk about in more detail the steps of the Krebs cycle and the electron transport chain. So I kind of covered this question here. Do you remember what happens when oxygen is not present? When oxygen is absent, you switch into anaerobic, um, the anaerobic pathways, the fermentation pathways. Okay. Um, so if you have oxygen present, you do all of the pathways of aerobic respiration. So this lecture is going to go into more of the detail about the Krebs cycle and the electron transport chain. So now we're moving the pyruvic acid from the cytoplasm into the mitochondria, and the second stage of the cellular respiration is something called Krebs cycle, named after Dr. Krebs. And so big picture here, what happens during the Krebs cycle? And again, I'm going to go fast. So remember, you're just copying the stuff that's highlighted, and if I go too fast, you can always pause me, unlike really in class, right? So what happens during the Krebs cycle, okay? Um, during the Krebs cycle, you're, the products of glycolysis, okay, so pyruvic acid is the product of glycolysis, is broken down, and the carbon dioxide that we inhale comes from, I'm sorry, we exhale, comes from the Krebs cycle. So every time we exhale and carbon dioxide comes out of our blood into our lungs and then from our lungs out of our body, it came from the Krebs cycle. And then the other materials, which are other large carbon molecules, then go through a series of energy extracting reactions. So we got, um, remember this this box here, um, what should go in this box? Glycolysis. This represents the Krebs cycle. And then this last box is the electron transport chain. I really recommend that you draw a little diagram like this. Okay, The pyruvic acid enters into the Krebs cycle. And it gets broken down. And this is a lot more detail than you really, really know need to know. What I want to introduce you to is this little molecule here called NADH, okay? Kind of like ADP, and you add the phosphate to make a higher energy molecule called ATP, okay? So ADP has less energy, um, potential energy, than ATP. NAD here, you glue on a hydrogen, and now it has more energy in it as NADH. 
So it's just a electron um, storage molecule, a hydrogen storage molecule, a way just to temporarily hold on to some energy. Because what have you created here? When you glue on the hydrogen, you've created a chemical bond. And remember, chemical bonds hold energy. So guess what's going to happen? If you break that, that hydrogen off of NADH to turn it back into NAD, what have you done? You're going to have to release energy. So it takes energy. Energy has to go in in order to glue the hydrogen onto NAD. So you're going to be creating these energy storage molecules. Okay? And a very complex series of chemical equations. And you don't have to know all this stuff, you guys. Okay? But you're noticing here as, as the pyruvic acid enters into the cycle and it goes around, you are creating some ATP, and you're making these NADH and FADH2 molecules. And so everywhere here, what's coming out, all of these items here that I'm putting a star by, these all are holding energy, okay? They're all holding energy in their chemical bonds. And guess where they're going to go? All of these things that I've circled are going to go to the next part of cellular respiration, which is the electron transport chain. And so the product, what we get out of breaking down just one molecule of pyruvic acid, and remember, we actually entered two molecules into this process. We make eight NADHs, two FADH2s, and two ATPs. So each, these are your totals that you're going to make. So, so far, have we made a lot of ATP? We got two from glycolysis plus two more here. We've only made four ATP. That's not very much. So now we've got a lot of energy left stuck in this NADH2 and this FADH2 and the NADH. And we want to get the energy out of those by breaking them down further. And this is where the Krebs cycle, I'm sorry, the electron cycle, electron transport chain comes in. Remember, what does the cell do with all those high-energy electron carriers? Well, it's going to use them in the presence of oxygen to generate huge amounts of ATP. Now, how this exactly happens, you don't really need to know. But I want you to know this, that the high-energy electrons, the products of the Krebs cycle, are used in the electron transport chain to make lots of ATP. Now, don't forget, you don't make ATP out of thin air. Floating around, you have adenosine diphosphate molecules, and you've got phosphate groups. And you take the energy out of the NADH and the FADH2, and when you break the hydrogens off, the energy is released. And guess what? It gets immediately captured by the ADP and put the phosphate on and you make ATP that way. So you're just handing the energy from one molecule to the next molecule by making and breaking chemical bonds. Constantly making and breaking. What molecule did we originally start with? We started with the glucose molecule originally, which was really, really big. NADH is a lot smaller. FADH2 is a lot smaller, but it's still bigger than ATP. So we're taking these large molecules and turning them into smaller ATP molecules. So it's like you could take one $100 bill and you only have one bill. Lots and lots of energy in that, lots and lots of spending power. But you need to break it down into a bunch of smaller bills. So you're going to turn it into $100 $1 bills. You get a lot more bills out of it that you can then use individually to buy individual things. So the electron transport chain converts the energy to, from ADP, I'm sorry, to, to convert ADP into ATP by breaking down those high energy bonds. It does it in the, the membrane of the mitochondria, and it does it by transporting and moving the electrons through these enzymes that are embedded in the membrane. And it's really not impo important that you guys know exactly what's happening, and you can go through this a lot more slowly. It's very, very complicated. I just want you to see that you're moving hydrogen ions around, you're moving electrons around, and this is happening in the inner membrane of the mitochondria, and the end result is to make lots and lots of ATP. Okay? So, for each pair of high-energy electrons that move down this electron transport chain, there's enough energy to make three ATP molecules. And so you see 
that when we look at our totals, we get just two ATP from glycolysis. But the complete breakdown of glucose gives us a total of 36 altogether. That's our grand total. When we look at the total all the way through and where we get them from each step, you see that if we have oxygen present and if we do the Krebs cycle, we get a complete breakdown, getting as much ATP that, as our bodies can get, and so it's 36 ATP, compared to only getting 2 ATP if we only do glycolysis. When we compare photosynthesis and cellular respiration to each other, you guys saw this in class today, that basically one is a reaction in which energy is moving in and being trapped, and the other one is an energy releasing type of equation. So which one is photosynthesis? How do you know? You can look at which one produces sugar. You get sugar as a product. And which one breaks down sugar as a reactant? There we have it. So which one is cellular respiration and which one is photosynthesis? Think about when your body needs to use energy, what do you have to do? You have to inhale oxygen. So this is the equation for cellular respiration. And you exhale carbon dioxide. Whereas a plant takes in carbon dioxide and water and makes its own food, it makes its own sugar, and it releases oxygen. So this is photosynthesis. And they really are basically the opposite of each other. Globally looking, this is going to help you on that Draw label, color, uh, draw, label, color, and explain. Um, photosynthesis and cellular respiration are opposites, and they really are dependent upon each other. Even though without us, plants would go on just fine because there are other sources of carbon dioxide besides humans. In fact, we're pumping way too much carbon dioxide out into the environment. Okay, I want you to, on your own, go through the quiz and we'll talk a little bit more about this tomorrow, and then we'll do our activity on lactic acid. See you tomorrow.